Thank you very much, Mark. So to set a little bit of context, uh, as Mark says, I'm from the Indigo Trust. We're a fairly small funder. We normally give out about 1.25 million US dollars uh, in grants a year, though, as Mark says, last week was somewhat exceptional. We gave out uh, 250% of our annual budget as an immediate response to COVID-19. In this case, though, I'm going to be talking about some of the work that we've historically funded, which relates to transparency and accountability. Now, when I started the organization two and a half years ago, we've been funding transparency and accountability initiatives in Sub-Saharan Africa for about seven years. And that was a really good opportunity, uh, fresh pair of ice coming in to review what we had done and to try and get a sense of what had the most impact, what had been successful, what hadn't been successful. And so myself and the team spent about six months going over everything that we'd funded and also doing much wider reading, looking at peer-reviewed literature, grey literature, to get a better sense of actually what stood a chance of working. And the fairly uncomfortable truth was that actually many of the things we'd funded really didn't have an impact at all, or they may have had an impact and it was very difficult to demonstrate that it had been the case. So either there were a whole host of other factors coming into play or that the scale of our funding was simply too small to be obvious as to whether it made a difference or not. There was one area, however, that really stood out to us as being potentially hugely significant, and that was legal information institutes. Now, what do they do, you may ask? They do something that to many of us is incredibly nerdy and unsexy and desperately unfashionable and that is that they make legal information freely available online and by legal information we're talking specifically around case law laws legislation bylaws etc you might think well who's going to use this stuff surely it's just lawyers who are already rich and therefore you're basically helping to support rich people now we could tell from the usage figures of the sites, many of these have sites have usage numbers in the hundreds of thousands of unique users a month, that it simply couldn't be the case that these were just being used by rich lawyers. And we had a fair chunk of anecdotal evidence to suggest that there were much wider societal benefits for funding this kind of work. So we give a proper evidence base to our, our hypothesis, our hunch, if you like. We commissioned my society who then carried out a piece of qual and quant research across 14 countries in sub-Saharan Africa with really detailed face-to-face uh, -face interviews in three in Ghana, Uganda and South Africa. And the overwhelming response, or sorry, overwhelming conclusion from that research was that these sites have a huge impact. It is because they make the law freely available to those who would not otherwise be able to access it because they can't pay 5,000 US dollars a month, a year to access a commercial legal service. Understandably, the people who tended to be the ones who couldn't afford those sums of money were the ones who were doing not competition law or corporate takeover law. They were the ones who were working on human rights. They were the ones who were representing litigants from poor communities. They were the ones doing pro bono law. And it was very clear that this area had a significant impact. And in some cases, such as in Uganda, it's fundamentally a pillar of the judicial system. You have judges who rely on it to be able to access case law. It's crucial. And yet, it is, as I say, sexy, desperately unfashionable, and few people get it in inverted commas. So with our relatively limited resources, we made the decision to say this will become our primary focus in terms of funding transparency and accountability in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and to that end, we've set up a separate fund for African Lee, which they're using to support Lees across the continent, as well as giving funding to them directly. That's the kind of background. I've probably talked for too long. I'm now going to hand over to Neil, who is going to talk about the much more interesting tech uh, side of things, and particularly how machine learning and a variety of tools can be used to make these services even better than they are already. Oh, Neil, I can't hear you. I think you're muted, Neil. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Can you? Okay, fantastic. 
Sorry. Um, okay, can I just check as well? Are we able to see uh, the slides? Yeah, the slides are there, Neil. All good. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you, Paul, for, for setting up that background. And thank you. I'm very excited to, to be able to share some of our experience in, in doing some more programmatic analysis uh, of the records that we have. Um, so as, uh, as Paul's laid out, uh, the African Legal Information Institute, we collect, we curate, and we publish jurisprudence across the continent, 16 jurisdictions in Africa. And that's using a model that has been around for quite a while as part of the global free access to law movement. Obviously, there are legal in, uh, information institutes all around the world. And we know that this model works for getting laws online, getting them accessible in areas where uh, it, it might have otherwise been impossible for people to find these documents. And we also know from the research that Paul and Rebecca have done uh, that, that now that, that this is also having an impact. Um, what African Lee started looking towards in 2018 and thereafter is how can we now use the records that we have in order to have more targeted collection, firstly, of the documents that we're collecting, and then also more targeted research for the end user on the other side to be able to find the documents that they're looking for on the one hand. And then the second area where we've started working a lot is uh, in, in trying to engage directly with civic society, uh, with civil society and with people who use this information and seeing what their needs are and how we can support them. Uh, and a lot of that is programmatic analysis and it's using um, more algorithms. And I'm gonna share with you what our experience has been there what work we've been doing and what impact we think that might have uh, in addition. So the first thing I'm going to chat about then is in terms of targeted publishing efforts is how we're now starting to look at getting the documents online that are the most needed and that are the most important. So there is a trade off, especially in law, the number of documents involved in legal processes is humongous. Uh, depending on how wide you cast the net, you can be talking hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions of documents uh, with courts. Um, and a lot of them are paper-based or they're uh, in basements in universities where they have to go and be scanned. Um, and getting hold of resources, uh, getting hold of documents is, is resource intensive and obviously we have limited resources. And so what we found is that we're at the point now where we have enough records in our existing database that we can start using those to form a positive feedback loop to try and create information about what we're missing. And the, the key sort of mechanism for doing that that we've been looking at, or one of the key ones, uh, is citations between documents and looking at documents as linked data. Uh, so this will be familiar even if you aren't in the legal sphere just from academic publishing. Obviously, there's links between uh, different publications and there's citations between them. Uh, in the legal sphere, this is even more important because of the fact that courts can set precedent and courts like to use uh, information that's come before. And what that means is that these links between judgments can give us a lot of information about which documents are important and how they're being used. So I'll just show you an example of what it looks like when you start treating court records as linked data and uh, visualizing those relationships between them. Um, so this is one of the sites that we've developed. And this is obviously on the researchers end to be able to, to navigate case law and find what they're looking for more easily. Uh, and you can see it illustrated as well, uh, how we've connected these different decisions and seen what the links between them are and also gotten measures of influence about how important cases are from that. So one of the most important things that we've been able to do with this information is to start asking the question about which judgments of courts uh, have received a lot of attention in other judgments, uh, but that aren't yet in our database. Um, and what I have here is some examples of records that we found uh, that are, have been cited very often and that have been very important in the development of the law in Africa um, that we can now go out and look for. So we have over here the top two cases are leading cases in Kenya about the granting of interdicts and the hearing of evidence on appeal. Um, interestingly, uh, there's two decisions over here, R versus Turnbull and the Miller case, uh, which in fact are English decisions. So very often in Africa, English law is quite influential in our jurisprudence and we do cite English decisions. And it's important for us to know as well which English decisions uh, are ones that are important 
uh, that we need to get so that practitioners in Africa also have access to that. Uh, we also have uh, decisions here that were prescribed works in universities. So again, for people studying, people trying to get into the legal industry, I'm going to speak later a, a bit more as well about the importance of that. Um, these are the sorts of decisions that can fall through the cracks if you're just trying to collect as many documents as you can. And so what we're now doing is keeping a record of what are the most important documents that we need to get a hold of. So the second uh, aspect that I wanted to speak about then, which is again linked to, you know, how can we improve the impact that we're having? Uh, you know, there's a lot of debate, I think, in this community around whether putting information online is, is sufficient for a publisher or whether they need to go further than that and make sure that it uh, is having an impact. Uh, again, I think as Rebecca's research has shown, even just having it online, having it available is massively important for practitioners in areas like human rights. And that does have a, a big impact on the rule of law and democracy in Africa. Uh, but we're now looking as well at going further than that and forming direct relationships with people who use these records uh, to have a sustained impact and see how we can help them. And now I'm going to share experience with two projects working on that. And the one is looking at transformation of the justice sector uh, itself. Um, and this is, I alluded to area, uh, earlier, this is um, very important, I think, for, for democracies in general, that the legal uh, sector is an open one. And there's one that people can, can come into, even if they're from a disenfranchised background, um, that they can enter into the legal space. There's very often strong links between the legal sector and the political sector. Uh, and people who are working in the one tend to be friends with people in the other. And so we need to make sure that there's transformation of the justice sector itself. So we uh, started a project with the Mail and Guardian, uh, and uh, they've got a bunch of data journalists over there uh, who want to do some investigative research into uh, what's happening in the courts. And this is all the information which is available but hasn't been made uh, machine readable and hasn't been made analyzable before. And so that's what we're trying to do to support their research. So just to give you an overview, for example, of what this looks like, um, we have in our records decisions of courts. Um, we, the, you also have then courts publish the court role, which gives information about which judges heard which decisions, uh, which judges have been sitting on what cases. And we can also see from within the judgment itself, if you look at the top left, uh, we are able to pick out which judges wrote uh, particular judgments, because sometimes you have more than one judge on a bench and they can write separate judgments on a single case. And we can start getting information about how many pages they're writing and, and what they're writing. And then at the bottom there, also from the, the, the body of the case itself to figure out who were the advocates um, who, were, who were representing in that case. Um, so some of the work that we've been doing there uh, is with the court roles to be able to do that link. Um, here's an example, this was a PDF uh, that just gets released by the courts and we've now put it into a machine uh, friendly format so that we can start getting out that link between who's hearing a case and who's not. Um, so that's the sort of support that we're able to offer to these data journalists and investigative journalists to say, uh, here's the information and how you can start tracking this and getting some empirics on it as well uh, and not just have this be a speculative thing. Um, another area in which we, we also are providing support is in election transparency research. So Afrobarometer, uh, political scientists and statisticians who do a lot of work on different indicators across the continent for democracy and uh, for the growth of countries. Um, and they have initiated a project where they want to look for what are the indicators, what are the pre uh, predictors of successful elections, transparency elections. And one piece of data that has been missing from their research has been information about the courts and legal proceedings around elections. And there are lots of these. There are tens of thousands of court decisions about elections and election related issues. And so by using our search tools and topic analysis, which is also something we're working on, uh, and then also extractive techniques to be able to find out from the body of, of cases what the decisions were and what the factors were in that decision, uh, we're making that available so that they can use that to do more investigation into what the factors are uh, implicating elections. Um, all of this work, uh, both in terms of, uh, you know, um, getting more records and getting the right records, helping people with research and engaging directly with people in civil society, uh, is also supported by something else that we have developed, which is um, a classifier for different topics. 
so that we can know which documents are coming from cases that are about human rights, which ones are coming from cases that are about elections or whatever the case might be. Um, so what that's involved is a lot of getting law students together to tag cases and to get them annotated uh, so the computer can learn from that. And yeah, it's just an example um, or some of the topics that we looked at in a project that we did last year uh, about separating court decisions into different uh, human rights that, that were affected. And we were able to use this to train an algorithm to then be able to extend that to the whole database. And so what that means is that when you're asking questions about uh, elections, for example, you can say uh, which cases involving elections were ones that impacted on the right to dignity, for example. Um, or when we're looking for cases that we're missing, uh, we're looking for important records that we need to add, we can say, what are the most cited decisions on the topic of human dignity, for example, that we don't have? And that allows us to further facets and narrow that down. So in summary, uh, we believe that access to the law is a foundation of strong democracies and the rule of, of law. Um, the source records themselves, the actual law uh, needs to be accessible. We found that without a free service, as Paul said, the commercial publishers outprice the majority of sole practitioners and people who aren't working in the commercial space. Um, and so that's our primary mandate. And the FALA model, the free access to law model is a good model for doing that, um, which is what the research has shown. Uh, we're now focusing more on impact uh, to, to lead to improvements in the service offering for researchers, to improvements in how we're collecting records and improvements for working with people uh, who directly use our, our records uh, uh, in order to, to do their projects in civil society. We're very eager for feedback, input, suggestions and support always. Um, we want to know, especially because we are a foundational provider and we provide the source records, uh, we want to know how it's being used and what people need. Um, and so we're always looking for that uh, where people can assist and where people can give input. Thanks. I hope that was, uh, you could hear me well. And uh, I don't know, Paul, you want I, to say I just had a couple of comments, else? not holding the mic so close to my face, which might have made things bad before. Apologies. Um, just to, to add on that point of support, which is an ask for any funders who might be on the call. This is an area, as I say, that is chronically underfunded. Some of these leaves, are, in fact, many of them are operating on a few tens of thousands of dollars a year. Until recently in Sierra Leone, the Lee was a wholly volunteer effort, and yet they would have judges contacting them asking for copies of uh, cases because they were so vital to the judiciary. It is a field where, in the scheme of things, relatively small amounts of money can make a tremendous difference, and particularly as many funders are funding areas such as anti-corruption and putting millions, if not tens of millions of dollars, into that fight, I think it would be wise of them to consider the value of the underlying judicial system that needs to be functioning in order for that fight to be successful, in order for the tools and materials to be available for the people who are working on the area, particularly of anti-corruption, but also on other areas, as, as Neil says, of human dignity, of rights, etc. So, Although it's a difficult time for many organisations, particularly in the funding space, do please bear the boring, unsexy, well, I find it quite sexy, actually, I have to confess, um, but unfashionable, shall I say, field of the free access to law as something for potential future funding.